Welcome to the show, Dan Go. So glad to have you here. Thanks for having me, brother. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time for for a number of reasons. And yeah. uh, you know, we've had some contact and connection over the last couple of years, but uh, there's always when I walk away from a conversation with you, there's always a desire to have a little deeper time with you. So excited for that. Yeah, same here. Uh, had you on in my podcast as well. Uh, I love the conversation that we had there. I hope I surprised you a little bit too. Um, and uh, yeah, over the years, you or actually over the past uh, six months, you and I have gotten pretty close to each other. So yeah, man, uh, I've gotten to know you as a, as a new person and I really appreciate that. Mm. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. So, so why don't we, um, let's jump right in to where I think um, some of our listeners would be really interested to hear about your journey, starting with, um, so I just want to introduce you as um, an expert in fitness and also not just an expert in fitness, but someone who really sees the way fitness fits into it's funny how fitness and like fit is the beginning of fitness. I didn't even think mm-hmm. about that, like <laughs> how it fits into the puzzle of our lives and, and wellness in general. And so tell us a little bit about how that came to be a big value for you in your life. How did that yeah. unfold for you? A hundred percent. So my entire life, I... Well, not my entire life. I'll say for my childhood up until the time I was about 20 years old, I was told that I was stupid, lazy, and everything else that falls into that umbrella. Uh, and up until that point, I had proven people right based on those assumptions about me. This was both friends and family. And and. I was pretty much headed nowhere. I was uh, I dropped out of high school and I was completely out of shape. And one of the things that actually was a signal to me uh, to get back into shape was uh, was when I played this game of basketball. Uh, one of my friends invited me to this game of basketball and I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to get back into shape. I'm going to try to get back into playing shape at least. And at that time I've been smoking cigarettes too. So like running up and down the court was just like, just horrible. It was one of the worst things ever. And then as I was running up and down the court, I started to notice a little bit of a jiggle inside of my chest. And I was like, and and first I thought it was a health problem. I was like, okay, this is weird. Uh, I never felt this before in my life. Afterwards, I went back home, took off my shirt. And then I realized that uh, my chest had started to exhibit the thing that we call man boobs. Wow. So yeah, it was, it was actually a shocker to me and uh, quite dissatisfied with where I had let my body go and didn't really think much about it. At that time, I was partying as well, partying a lot, drinking a lot, doing a lot of drugs. Uh, and I remember there was just this one time I came home and I came home at like 6 a.m. in the morning and I opened the door. I'm in this like drunken, eyes dilated stupor. And I see my dad right when I walk in the door at 6 a.m. And then I, and then he looks at me. He's just like got this like disappointed look in his face. He's just like, God damn. And I asked him where he was going. And he just said, Hey, he didn't even say, Hey, he just said, I'm going to the gym. And then off he went. And for the next two years after that, I started to see him go to the gym every single morning. No fail. Never said anything to me. Uh, I saw him to get get his body healthy. Uh, again, never told us to eat a certain way. He just did it for himself. And lo and behold, you know, fate comes and uh, my dad ends up, uh, because he's like the star, you know, gym goer, you know, they, they gave him a two month pass to the gym. And he actually gives it to my brother. And my brother's just like, it's like everything up until that point, you know, my brother handed me down my clothes. And then after it's like, I'm not going to use this. So he actually handed me the two month pass. And when I got the two month pass to the gym, I said to myself, I was like, you know what, you know, what's the worst that can happen at this point? I'm just like playing video games all day. 
I'm uh, just eating a bag of potato chips on the couch. I'm literally doing nothing. What is the worst that can happen for me going to the gym? I'll probably see some attractive women. You know, pretty awesome, right? (laughs) So I end up going to the gym and uh, doing everything horribly inside of the gym. And they do that for about two weeks straight. It was literally like this thing to do. You know, I looked at it as like, oh, I'm not doing anything. So here's the thing to do. And I end up, uh, I'm in the change room one day and I'm putting on my belt, you know, my belt buckled back. And then I remember distinctly, so vivid, I go about two notches past my belt line. And I'm just like, what? Wait, what Mm -hmm. the heck? Right. I, I, mm-hmm. I didn't even change the way I was dieting. I wasn't even doing like any like running or anything like that. I was just doing weight training. And it was at that time where I realized that, holy crap, this stuff is like pretty awesome. And it wasn't until later on in life, I would say about two years of going to the gym, where I started to realize the changes that it was making to my brain and to my psychology and just the way that I was thinking about myself. I was actually being active. And it wasn't until I looked back two years and I was just like, wow, like, look at all this change that I've made. And the little gains that I've made inside the gym were gains I was making outside of the gym. And that I would have to say that uh, going to the gym was one of the critical moments of, of my entire life. Wow. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm struck by the, um, kind of the metaphor that, that comes up a lot when I think about training is the, the psychological gains of, um, across the board, just showing up, Yeah, you know, uh, setting goals, um, very patient, you know, day by day, getting there over time. I mean, these are, these are things that apply, um, to so many areas of growth. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree. Interesting. Wow. I agree. And, and just the metaphor of the gym itself, like I can't connect the dots looking back, but just the metaphor of the gym itself, which is like, go to the gym, you show up. That's number one. Like the, the biggest win is actually just crossing the line and showing up. And then all you do is make like small incremental improvements to the things that you're doing. Uh, right. You know, just that little metaphor right there is, is kind of like something that I've carried with me. Um, it's it's almost like been a mantra for my entire life. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and the the way that we often go about trying to make changes in our life is so uh, dramatic and frantic and disorganized and set up to fail because we're not taking that kind of more determined, uh, methodical, slow approach. Yeah. We, we want all or nothing when the reality is, is, uh, it's all about just like the little tiny steps and the seemingly insignificant, uh, compound movements that you're making towards this. It's not even a goal. You're just doing it because you can. And Mm -hmm. It, it really like even when I um you know uh, this about the last two years I've I've really grown uh, my business my brand and the only two things that really showed up in my mind as I was doing this was show up do the work show mm-hmm. up do the work and just make small tiny incremental improvements and you know it is cliche to say but it's like all those little you know incremental improvements they turn into like like a hundred percent growth after like maybe 300 days. Right. Right. It's ridiculous. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And you, you don't, you don't have, or most of us, I think most of the time, including myself, of course, is we don't hold that longer uh, view. Yeah. Uh, it's over the horizon of our, our vision. Yeah. 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 And then, and then we, you know, don't get where we could have gone if we just made 1% changes over, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so let's back up a minute to you. You mentioned you've grown your brand a lot in the last couple of years in your work, and um, but it wasn't always. You weren't always doing things the way you do it now. And yeah. you work with uh, entrepreneurs, uh, founders, people who 
are oftentimes really crushing it on the business side or getting crushed um, by the <laughs> operation of a business or both. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, and how did... So, but for a while you were working, you, did you own a gym at one point? I, yes, I owned yeah. a gym up until 2018. I owned it for about uh, 11 years. And, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's, you know, back up just a little bit before that, because, uh, you know, before I owned the gym, um, I was actually working this in the corporation and it was almost like the pinnacle of my life at that point of working in this corporation. Cause I was like, okay, cool. I have a steady paycheck. My parents were happy. And it was something that I completely hated with mm -hmm. my soul. And I couldn't even tell people what I was doing. Wow. Like literally I couldn't because like what I was doing first was like collections, which is fine. And then, you know, I moved up quote, quote unquote, moved up to uh, selling high interest loans or selling high interest uh, yeah, loans to, to people who really just didn't need them. And it felt so sharky and it felt so kind of like, uh, it just felt like I was just making their lives worse, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, and I felt like I was like stuck in that corporate, I guess you could say that corporate structure for the rest of my life. And I was like in this life where I felt like I was going to settle for something where I didn't feel like I would be even passionate about what I would do. And it wasn't necessarily until my mom actually got really sick, very all of a sudden. And, uh, you know, dad calls us, you know, on the phone and he's like, hey, you guys got to come to Niagara Falls because they're on a date over there. And then uh, and then we realized that, uh, you know, she's fighting for her life and we didn't even know what happened. Hmm. And. We get her airlifted to a different hospital because they have dialysis treatments there. And we go through a six month ordeal where we are just going through different treatments. She's in the ICU. And, you know, lo and behold, we thought that uh, we actually thought that the sky was opening up and that she was actually going to get better. So they actually send her down to a lower unit. And during that time she was in the lower unit, she gets pneumonia and she ends up, uh, she ends up not having enough blood to her brain during that entire time because they weren't necessarily looking after her or keeping an eye on her at that time. Mm. So long story short, you know, uh, mom, uh, passed away. Uh, and that was the most crushing blow I've ever experienced in my life. And as with anyone that loses a mother, uh, I was pretty depressed, pretty distraught. And one of the things that I was asking myself or actually in my mind about when this whole thing was going on was, I was actually, there was a voice that came on in my mind. I was just like, this thing can either burn you up or you can either use it to fuel yourself. So which one are you going to choose? And it was at that point, I decided to, I decided to really pursue something that I was extremely passionate about, which was fitness, you know, ironically. And mm -hmm. I pursued that. I quit my corporate job. I, I went through being a personal trainer, went through the, the ringer and that, and then after I became the one of the top trainers at that gym, I ended up owning a gym, and I did that for about eleven years. And then afterwards, uh, I sold my gym in about December twenty eighteen. And then, you know, that's where I am right now. I'm uh, helping entrepreneurs, uh, founders, uh, high achievers, to not only transform their lives, not only transform their bodies, but to also transform their lives through the aspect of fitness and getting their bodies in shape. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. And, um, thanks for sharing that, uh, journey with your mom. It sounds, sounds really tender and painful for your family. Yeah. And, um, wow. And so at some point you were working with people, you owned your own gym, you're working with people in the gym. 
how, what was your thought process of deciding to focus on founders and entrepreneurs? What was appealing about that to you? Well, after working in the fitness industry for about 17 years and dealing with all walks of people, all, all people of like every single area of life that I could think of, professional athletes, uh, stay-at-home moms, uh, entrepreneurs, obviously, I asked myself, uh, who are, okay, number one, who are the people I enjoy working with the most? And uh, you and I are actually a part of uh, this particular group of uh, just incredible men, incredible entrepreneurs. And one of the things that uh, I realized when I went to one of these events, I was like flabbergasted at how many entrepreneurs let their bodies go as a result of their business. I, I felt like entrepreneurs are these like superheroes and these guys who are just like world crushers and they feel and believe that they can have it all. And then when I walked into this conference, I realized that, holy crap, uh, there, there are some ceilings that some of these guys are dealing with when it comes to their health. They feel like they have to sacrifice their health in order to, in order to build a business or in order to get more success in a business. And that was one of the things that just didn't sit with me. And when I asked myself, who do I want to work with? Entrepreneurs was number one, two, and three. And I was also like, I don't ever want to see my friends get out of shape. Hmm. And, uh, and at this point, uh, I would say like 90% of my friends are entrepreneurs. And for me, when I transform their lives and when I actually get them, to get them in shape, I know for a fact that uh, number one, the brain's going to be working better. They're going to live longer lives, which means that it can impact their, uh, their ability to make more money. And also they're just being more confident versions of themselves, their wives like it. It's literally like this meta effect on their entire mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, I feel like, you know, if I can help entrepreneurs transform their bodies, then we get better stuff. We actually get better services. We get better products because their brains are just working at such a high level because we cannot deny the brain and body connection. And the fact that if you don't have a healthy body, it's going to affect the way that you think. It's going to affect the way you make decisions. So, so that's the reason why I chose entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Makes sense. And, um, you know, I was just, as I was listening to you talk about entrepreneurs, I, I was thinking about and reflecting on my own experience. I spent a lot of time in a chair and I look at a screen like I'm doing right now with you mm -hmm. yeah. for hours a day, <laughs> six to eight hours a day. Yeah. Um, and so for people in the audience who might be thinking, well, geez, I, I have to, you know, uh, I don't have time for this or, you know, mm -hmm. how I, I have to X, Y, Z, or, you know, I can't commit to an hour or two in the gym every day. Um, what would you say to that someone who is kind of, um, in the mindset that their livelihood, you know, their business, uh, requires them to sit in a chair and, and be sedentary and, um, mm. you know, eat, uh, snacks they can readily get to. And, um, where, where do you start with people who are kind of in the, uh, maybe, I don't know. We have in, in, in psychotherapy, we have this thing called motivational interviewing where you're, <laughs> you're inviting the question in your mind as a practitioner is, is this person ready for change? And, uh, where are they on the spectrum of that? Yeah. Yeah. We, well, you know, before working with people, that is actually something that we do, which is to make sure that they are ready for change first. Uh, I think a lot of people, they get pushed into something before they're ready uh, by outside forces. Uh, and and for me, like when someone comes in and works with us, they they literally have to want it. And they have to know that this is an area of their lives that needs tending. Now, you know, where we start with them is, you know, we start with where do they want to go? Uh, what do they struggle with right now? What do they feel like they need in order to get themselves from where they are to where they need to be? And a couple of other things that we do is, you know, we work on, okay, what kind of beliefs do you actually have about yourself when it comes to physical activity and even your body in general? Uh, you know, 
what kind of conversations are going on in your brain when it comes to this physical aspect, your body, when it comes to your health? What limiting beliefs are you actually holding onto? And one of the things that we want to do is we actually want to create new beliefs. Our main thing is, is that as the body goes, the mind goes. As the mind goes, the body goes. It's like a cyclical thing. It, it is not the chicken and egg scenario. Both of these things work together. Mm -hmm. And from our perspective, the mind is a goal-seeking mechanism, but it's also a goal-seeking mechanism for anti-goals as well, right? So if you're directing the mind towards the things that you don't want, the beliefs that you carry with yourself uh, or the self-limiting beliefs that you have, those actually need to change in order for you to make the changes in your health and your body. So it is a cyclical thing. And then afterwards, we get into the nitty gritty of like, okay, so how much should you be eating? What does your food schedule look like? Uh, you know, what kind of exercises should we be doing? What exactly do you want your body to look like? And, and I look at kind of like the, the process of body transformation as, especially from the mental aspect of things, as like this trifecta. So you have your conscious brain, you have your subconscious brain, and then you have your self-image, the way in which you see yourself. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to actually see exactly what's happening with the conscious brain so we can actually direct our subconscious brain and create a new self-image where we actually have a new way uh, in which we see ourselves. And then that is where I feel uh, the the sustainable change comes from. Um, and, and I would say like that's pretty much like a long view of like where we start, but everything's done kind of like step by step, uh, bit by bit. So, you know, it's, it's not even a perfect process. We actually start where we feel like we need to start, you know, the most, I guess you could say. Right. Where the person yeah. is suffering the most or, yeah, 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 yeah that makes sense. Um, yeah. And the, the interface between the mind and the body is obviously a really big part of what we do over here at um, IPI and looking at um, that bidirectional communication between the two. Um, I think of it, the mind as um, not not only uh, kind of like goal seeking, but also uh, meaning making and mm -hmm. so storytelling, you know, uh, yeah. what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? I'm always asking, mm -hmm. what does it mean unconsciously? And, and so I appreciate, I really appreciate how you frame that of, you know, the, the trifecta and how important it is to, to pay attention to the stories that we're telling ourselves. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, we do have this perception and we are, we are ruled by our perceptions, both of ourselves and of the external world. And one of the biggest, the most powerful things that we can do is control our perceptions of ourselves, control our perceptions of the world around us. That's that's one of the first ways that you actually get back your power when it comes mm -hmm. to your health and your body and, and just in general for uh, for your own worldview in general. So if we can control those perceptions, we can actually change, if we can actually mold our beliefs, not necessarily change them, but mold them towards what we want, then we're actually doing the hard work in front. So when we have to do yeah. the nitty gritty stuff, then, then that stuff, you know, it, it already happens because it is who you are as a person it is in line with your beliefs of who you are. Right. Yeah, exactly. And not the end, not fighting upstream against yeah. the, the flow of negative beliefs or, or thought patterns, perceptions. 100%. Yeah. Well, speaking of unconscious mind, uh, I'm excited to talk to you also about how you know, these, some of these advanced tools that we have riffed about on your <laughs> podcast and in our conversations. And I think about advanced tools, I'm talking about psychedelics and, uh, psychedelic healing. And, um, I'm, I'm really curious, uh, if you, would you be willing to share a little bit more about what, what led you to, to go seeking, uh, psychedelic sessions for healing for yourself? A hundred percent. Um, so I actually have posted this many times and it's a very, I call it a pretty unpopular opinion in the sense that drugs have actually changed my life for the better, right? And a lot, when people hear that, they're like, oh my God, especially if you've like been born in our era, whereas you have like Nancy Reagan and like the whole, mm -hmm. you know, the say no, say no yeah. to drugs, you know, or the DR campaigns, but uh, I started off recreationally with psychedelics, um, taking magic mushrooms 
or psilocybin that is, um, and doing these and, and actually doing MDMA at like raves when I was, you know, partying like crazy. So I didn't come in with this like fear around psychedelics uh, when I was approached with the idea of therapy. And when I was approached with it, I actually heard of a couple of my friends uh, doing psychedelic therapy with drugs that I've used before in the past. I'm like, dude, that that actually sounds pretty freaking cool. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember one of my friends told me uh, that it was uh, it was as if you were doing um, seven years of therapy in like six hours. And I'm like, soul. And, you know, <laughs> it's like, but there's, uh, you know, you know, but. Uh, but I actually went through the process. I was really interested. And, you know, when I first went to the process, I was like, okay, let's do psychedelic therapy so I can be more successful at business. That was like my first thought outcome, outcome focused. And right. I ended up, uh, going through the preliminary sessions. Like you just, you just don't like jump on a couch. Um, they they got me through, I think it was like three sessions with a psychiatrist, I believe. Um, and the very first few sessions, I'm like, we ended up unveiling, unveiling things about my past that uh, I've never really talked to anyone about before. These were things about uh, situations that were happening with my family, uh, my brother my father and the ways in which I perceive those interactions. Um, and then I ended up going into it thinking I'm going to be like, Oh, so successful at business. And I'm going to use this to supercharge me when the reality was is like, I was holding on to some deep seated resentment towards the way that I was raised. Cause mm -hmm. I came from a family of, I was a latchkey kid. My mm -hmm. family were immigrants and they worked their asses off. They worked 12 to 24 hour days. They owned a printing shop. We were raised or I was raised by my second oldest brother. And, okay. and he's just two years older than me. And do you know what? Like brothers who are two years older than you probably don't know how to raise you as a child. Right. <laughs> or even if they do know. <laughs> yeah. I was like, he'll probably need therapy or something. Like, I don't know. But yeah. So so like the way in which I was raised, let's just say by my brother, I carried and harbored some deep seated resentment towards him mm -hmm. because obviously he's not a parent, but you know, he would he would get his way in ways in which he felt were the ways he could get his way. If that makes any yeah, sense, it totally would, makes sense. Yeah, and I and I would be, I'll, I'll I'll put it out there like I was bullied, you know, as a kid, yeah. both like physically and emotionally, by my brother, and I remember going into these sessions and talking about these things, and I'm like, wow, I I, I really did not realize that I had this shit in me in the first place, because you know when you grow up, you you see your your brother and your your dad, and you're like, you know hunky dory and everything is like normal but the reality is is that um if you don't really go back and and this is actually one of the reasons i was addicted to marijuana most likely because i needed a way to numb the way i was feeling yeah. in those types of situations so you know i i end up going through the process of uh you know doing these sessions and then i go into the actual uh, therapy session. And it turned out to be like one of the most vivid experiences of my entire life. Hmm. And um, what, what medicine were you working with or uh, MDMA primarily? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. MDMA. Yeah. Um, and I remember going into that session, you know, and, and literally I was taking myself through the entire uh, session uh, it's literally like the therapists were just sitting there and I was taking myself through this entire journey. And I remember, you know, just listening to me narrating this journey after I had done this and it was just surreal. Mm. And, and while I was going through this whole thing, 
there were a number of things that like came up for me. So one of them was uh, letting go of my mom. Um, I had still held on to her and I had still wanted her to, you know, I was still almost like wanting to hold on to her and wanting to hold on to, you know, just, just the fact that I just wanted to be with her. Yeah. And I remember going through this session and having, and, and literally going through like a process where I was just letting my mom just float away and mm. allowing that to happen. And, um, there's also something else that happened. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm Any curious. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I was just wondering about in that moment of watching your mother float away in this session, what was the, what was the feeling that you were experiencing there? To let her go. To so like acceptance, acceptance mm -hmm. and to let her go and to just accept the fact that she's gone. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't, and, yeah. there wasn't like a, a struggle or a fight in you of trying to hold on as she was floating away. Uh, I, th I think when you're, well, when I look back to that, I mean, there's no struggle of me wanting to keep her there. Mm -hmm. There was zero struggle, but it was more so like, do I have to, mm. you know? Yeah. Do I really have to? Yeah. yeah. And. Mm -hmm. And then she and and then it was just a it was like this conversation between the both of us to allow her to you know to go off into the light, so to speak. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And um I remember some other lessons that you know that came up during that time. I, I feel like the the process of MDMA is very compassionate. It's very forgiving. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also lets you see the side of, it lets you see the other side of things as well. Mm -hmm. So the things that I came up with, uh, in regards to like my dad and my brother, you know, was the fact that, uh, you know, they, they did the best with what they had with mm -hmm. what they learned, you know, like you, you could see that with the support that. of the MDMA. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, like my dad taught my brother. And my brother had those tools. Those are the only tools he had. Yeah. Uh, the tools that I have right now are not the tools that my dad had. And yeah. when he came to, uh, when he came to Canada, uh, he had zero dollars in his bank account. He had to like mm -hmm. hustle, and yeah, you know, he he wanted us to survive. Yeah, right. And he did all he could. So yeah. So. You know, it was just coming to terms with that and seeing it from the other angle of things, which yeah. allowed me to kind of like release a little bit of, or a lot of like uh, resentment I had towards how I was raised. And then, um, and the best part was, uh, the best part was so weird, man. I'm going to tell you this right now. It's just so weird. So there was this, uh, so there was like a male and a female therapist in okay. uh, the session. And then uh, during that entire session, I ended up uh, seeing this, I think it was like a five or seven year old version of me. Hmm. I was just like, he was just like wounded inside of this cocoon. I don't even know mm -hmm. how to explain it. And then thankfully, I mean, the, the female therapist was kind of like leading me through this as I was narrating it. And it was like, Hey, so what do you want to do with this guy? And I was just like, ah, I just want to hug him, you know, mm -hmm. tell him it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, we're, we're going to do this. We're, we're going to do this together. Don't worry. <laughs> and then, uh, it was, uh, it was one of the most poignant moments that I remember from not only that session, but just, is very vivid in my mind, even to this day mm. where I ended up, uh, she's like, well, do you want to like, you know, bring him in? And, uh, I was like, yeah, sure. I ended up trying to bring him in and he was just like, no, no, don't want to do this right now. Don't want to mm. do this. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up, uh, kind of just like 
giving him a pep talk and just like, Hey, dude, don't worry. We're going to be okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to be okay. Yeah. I promise you. And then it's like, I took him in into my soul or my heart. Mm. And after that, I don't know exactly what happened. And then I actually had to like Google that, like literally after the session, I was like, what the heck? What that? just happened? <laughs> yeah. I was like, what was that? What uh, did the, uh, what did the Google search show you there of what, uh, what just happened? So there was like this thing called inner child therapy mm -hmm. uh, that I found in Google. Um, mm -hmm. And it was like integrating the, the child that's within us mm -hmm. and the, the child that's in us had to do things in certain ways to protect us. Yeah. But those ways don't necessarily work anymore as we're adults. Right. And, and me coming from a, like a background of like being physically and emotionally abused, you know, I had to do certain things like maybe like, you know, smoking marijuana every single day or whatever mm -hmm. it is right. to protect me yeah. and to numb the way I was feeling. I really think like even like smoking marijuana every day, like, uh, you know, this again, like I, I think that kind of saved me a little bit because I don't know if I would have gone crazy. I don't know. But but again, it just helped me numb the way that I was feeling. Um, and then it's just the ways in which we protect ourselves are not necessarily the ways that we need to protect ourselves now. Well, we have to be hmm. we have to actually incorporate these emotions. We have to deal with them. We have to face them. You know, we have to face our fears and we have to face the things that we're trying to stay away from in order to surpass them or in order to integrate them into who we are as people. So, yeah, uh, after that whole thing of the Google search, I, I ended up like listening to my recording of like six hours for like three times, taking like mm -hmm. all these like copious notes and then um, and integrating or trying to do as much integration as possible after the session. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing all that. It's really very profound. Yeah. The uh, the the way you describe this kind of encounter between the you that that you think of as you, right? Like the the you in the present and the you in the past, like the the inner child, and um, healing that connection between yeah. uh, the two of you. And um, that process reminds me of um, certain experiences as an MDMA therapist that I've had um, over the years and, and seeing people do really deep, really deep healing. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I just mention one thing? It's uh, like the therapist that I was uh, doing this with. One of the things that struck me was like he was crying. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, why are you crying? <laughs> and he's just like, this is heavy work, man. Like, he's just like, this is heavy work. And that was something that just like struck me. I was just like, wow, like this, this guy actually like, he takes it in mm. this way, which was powerful yeah. for me to mm. see. Yeah. How, how, how did that impact you? Um, I, I, cause no one had ever cried at, uh, me telling my story, mm. you know, like, uh, like, People I would tell, you know, this story to, I wouldn't necessarily. And uh, even if I did or said something about it, I'd be like, you know, just man the fuck up, you know, just man up and stop being a little whatever about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and for someone to actually listen to what I say, to feel the pain that I felt or to, to have actually like just listened enough to, to know what I was going through. And to have had that affect them that way, I was, I was genuinely surprised, and mm. it touched me to yeah. a large extent. Yeah, yeah. The um, the people I know um, in MDMA therapy who 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 mentored me and trained me and who have been in the work for for decades. Um, <clears throat> talk about how there's a field of uh, MDMA that the therapists also can feel and even though they're not taking the MDMA and it's like this um, it's like this very open compassionate uh, receptive uh, 
perception that a therapist who is experienced with holding space with MDMA therapy can can actually feel in themselves. And <clears throat> it's interesting that um, over years and decades, um, I when I've been in the room with people who are extremely experienced, uh, you you can see people actually still, you know, and maybe this is obvious, but it wasn't to me that people still get very uh, impacted emotionally by what's happening uh, for the client. It's like everyone is having a, a healing um, in the room, uh, but there's also something incredible, not but, but and there's something incredibly inspiring and, and, um, and healing for the witness to see someone doing that deep healing work and uh, knowing on some level deep down what that's going to mean about that person's life and you know how they're going to bloom and uh, and and end up um, being so much ha having so much more capacity to give their gifts to the world because these currents have been um, the you know the current of trauma has been um, smoothed out in a way yeah and um, to me it signifies that they take their stuff seriously they take their work seriously. And they know the impact that it's having on the people that they're doing it for. And no matter how many sessions that they do, they still feel that way. Yeah. You know, it's uh, sometimes you can take change for granted. Um, mm. Even when I, even when I change, uh, you know, people's bodies and I get them in shape, it's like, sometimes you can really, you know, just, you've done it so many times. You could just take it for granted that you're actually making this like significant change in their lives. So for me to see uh, the therapist uh, share my pain and to uh, you know to shed a tear for for me, uh, that was probably you know one of the most. I remember. I, I literally remember. I was like, "Dude, why are you crying, man?" Like, <laughs> it was like so surprising to me. And then, mm -hmm. and then when I thought about it longer, I was just like, "Wow." Um, he takes his work seriously, and he knows what he's doing. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And so this was some years ago that you underwent yeah. this kind of healing. And it, I mean, just watching your face and how you're describing your experience, it's, it looks like the, the insights and the, you know, if you want to call them benefits or the results are still pretty fresh. Yeah. I've, I, th I believe that this was the point of time in my life where I went from looking at these drugs as something to do recreationally and looking at them as something that could actually be done to make me better, uh, to, mm -hmm. to be used in a therapeutic sense. Like I don't use them recreationally anymore. I, t I just like mm -hmm. have no desire whatsoever. And I don't even do it often, but when I do do it, I mean, it's with intention. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's being open to the experience and allowing anything that comes forth as a result of that, and and to use them as like literal tools to to see them as like a hammer or like a wrench or mm -hmm. you know just whatever it is is to actually use it to make my life better, um, and just to make sure that I don't get to like you know uh, sucked into the whole. Uh, I guess you could say like the psycho not experience and to mm -hmm. give myself time to like literally just in like, I, I call it integrate, but just to like marinate or to, to kind of like, just like, you know, be with the things that I've learned during the times that I've taken these, uh, these tools. Yeah. There's, um, there's not enough emphasis on integration and uh, digestion. Yeah. Is another one for me is like just that term because, you know, ripening, uh, you know, say marination, same idea, like mm -hmm. the, the margin of benefit that can be gained, um, in some ways is even bigger than the actual six hours that you were describing. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And really missing. I think a lot of people really miss that opportunity. Um, yeah, I, I, for me, it's like, I just, you know, I've seen my own friends kind of go through this and then 
one of the things that I've always been wary about is just like going from one like thing to another without giving it time, you know, without mm-hmm. giving yourself enough time to, to just like, like you said, digest it. And, and I think like sometimes like it, these things can be used as escapes yeah, r- rather yeah. than as yeah. tools. Yeah. yeah, for, for sure. The psychonaut um, kind of, metaphor you're talking about of uh going from one peak experience to another one one psychedelic experience to another um i knew um i had friends when i was really deep in my healing work with ayahuasca there were um and i was i was guilty of it myself of going back for more and more and more ceremony and and not and then i would actually get a message from ayahuasca after a while of Hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> you, you, you haven't even taken, you're not even respecting what I gave you the last time you were here. What are you doing here? Like, get out of here. Go, go digest what I gave you before. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, the, that's the hardest work, actually. Like, that's yeah. what I would consider to be the hard work. It's easy to, like, I think the easy part is going underneath and, you know, going through that journey. The hard part is like taking out your journal. And like sitting with yourself for the next mm. couple of days, next couple of months, next couple of even like whatever it is, and like getting deep, deeper just through your own sober experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like um I I, I don't know if other cultures are different, but I think that the the culture that, you know, uh that we're in in you know western culture north american culture kind of dominant culture we uh we have so much like and maybe this is also just like human nature i don't know but we're we're so focused on content um we're so focused on what the kind of like blips of things are in the space um that we don't even recognize the field or like what the background is mm. and we're constantly you know, feeding on, you know, consuming more and more content and, yeah. and like gorging ourselves on content. And then there's no digestion going on. I, I've heard this term, which is uh, infobesity. Right? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. That's which the first like, one for me. Yeah. I, and I love it because, I mean, we have turned into this information society. And, uh, you know, even when I talk to like entrepreneurs and they want to get in shape, like, they want to do like all the like blood type tests and they want to do this and they want to do that and whatever it is. I'm like, bro, you're not even like sleeping eight hours right now. Let's like work on that. Right? <laughs> you know? yeah. Fundamentals. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. work on the basics uh, first. And, <laughs> and the thing is, is that like, because of like, we, we have such pre access to information. It's almost like this, uh, this, I guess you could say it's a, it's a talent or maybe it's skill to know which information to take in and to sit with it and to apply it and to apply it until it doesn't serve you anymore. And then to go on to the next thing, because it's so easy for us to like read a book, then go on to the next book, then go on to the next book without necessarily even like digesting the information that we've learned. Yeah. And we, uh, we get bored really fast. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I remember, one time my daughter came to me when she was, I don't know, 11 or 12. And she said, dad, I'm so bored. <laughs> and I said, well, I want a full report on boredom. I want you to yeah. go explore that, get in there, understand it, feel it, vibe it out yeah. and come back and report back to me. Like what? I, I want, I want you to get in there and see, you know, <laughs> bring that back. <laughs> like I've, we have this like, weird relationship with boredom that people will go to the lengths of taking drugs or eating food in order to uh in order to mask the boredom um when the fact is is that being in that space of boredom it actually it is like you and Mm -hmm. it is sitting with you and that is actually the space of awareness and the space of creativity and i find that um so i have a friend who goes on walks and then he he needs he goes on like hour long walks and he always brings like a podcast with him and i tell and i tell him I was like dude don't bring the podcast with you do it without your phone okay you will actually be 10 times 100 times more creative mm. as a mm. result of just walking mm. through the forest and not even listening right. to anything but just listening to yourself 
And, and if we can just like get back that, that feeling of sitting with ourselves to be able to be bored, uh, you know, that alone will help us know ourselves, but also I think it's going to come up with like some amazing creativity for our businesses, yeah. for our lives, for our families. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> oh man, there's so many different directions to go Where'd we, in this we, conversation. Yeah, yeah. I'm on a tangent I, there. I, I'm loving this though. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. I'm reminded of, uh, I'm just going to go off and follow this rabbit down this yeah. hole here. Um, years ago, I was a uh, pretty devout Tibetan Buddhist practitioner and I spent about eight years um, after I met my teacher and fell in love with my teacher and started going on retreats. And I, I probably spent over an eight year period, I spent about a year total in conglomerate in a retreat, um, solitary and group. And one time I was in solitary retreat in this tiny cabin and I had one book with me and it was uh, from my teacher's teacher. And, and there's this chapter in his book. Um, the book is called The Myth of Freedom. And by Tr Trungpa Rinpoche, Chogyam Trungpa. And uh, there's this chapter where he talks about the different kinds of boredom. And there's hot boredom and there's cold boredom. And there's all these different kinds of boredom. And, and I was just thinking like, wow, like how attentive you have to be and, and how much you have to respect the experience of boredom to actually categorize the different styles of boredom, mm. <laughs> the different nuances. You know? what, 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 okay, so what was an example of like hot boredom and, and cold boredom? So cold boredom, you're, you know, this is my memory, so I don't know <laughs> if it's accurate. The spot. <laughs> my, my memory was that cold boredom is this like almost like sleepy, like it's not interesting mm. boredom. Um, and then hot boredom is more of this like angsty, like angry, like irritated, like I'm actually having an emotional reaction to my boredom. Mm. Like it's uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, and I think that kind of boredom he called it uh, a doorway or a gateway into what you're talking about, like a bigger experience, like your mind opens up if you're willing to stay, stay with it, you know? So yeah. his instruction was just, you know, stay with it and see what happens next. Yeah. You know? There was this uh, Veritasium YouTube video that I was watching probably when I was bored, most likely, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> probably when I was watching when I was bored. And then he was just like, uh, they did some studies where, um, you know, just uh, allowing yourself to like, do nothing and you know not like try to numb your boredom out with anything uh they actually found that people were more intelligent people were more creative in that sense and when you think about like the the hot and cold boredom um the hot boredom to me sounds like anxious energy a mm. little bit you know yeah. and the cold boredom seems like okay well you know one well, i could you know laying there and sitting there and doing nothing seems like almost like torture to a lot of people. It's like, what? I'm not going to have my phone on me. I'm, I'm <laughs> not going to be able to watch YouTube videos. But but there is something to it. It's like, uh, even, even uh, I forgot what the writer, who the writer was. Maybe it was like Thoreau. Who who did Walden? I forgot who. Thoreau. Yeah, Henry okay. Thoreau. Yeah. Where, where he just like lays on like a, a freaking like rowboat and, and yeah. really does nothing and just, you know, yeah. just just lays there. I think we need to get back there. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's really hard for us right now. You know, in the the world that you know we're living in, because obviously we have this access to like the the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, the, the secrets of the universe, and it's honest to like you know we want to find out. We're curious, but you know there is something to be said about just like letting yourself just sit and just like do absolutely nothing with that. Mm -hmm. And see how long you could do it. That's actually why I love meditation too. You know, it's just yeah, yeah. Yeah, building a, a muscle of uh, attention and yeah. patience. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to go, okay, so now we're coming kind of full full circle here into yeah. uh, not just fitness, not just psychedelics, not just the body, not just the mind, but the, the two together. And I want to ask you a few specifics uh, to put you on the spot. Um, one thing that I think would be really interesting for people to know is what your routines are, uh, mm -hmm. for your own health, um, as, as an expert in, uh, fitness and an expert who I would say from my perspective is more of an integrative 
uh, approach to fitness. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about sleep and diet and, and not just workouts. Gotcha. I'll take you, uh, I'll probably take you through the, like the, the whole entire day. Um, yeah. So, you know, wake up around six, six thirty. uh, I'll tell you what a perfect day looks like. And then, you know, okay. obviously like I'm not perfect. Uh, we all have imperfect days and we don't, we don't always get this stuff done, but what a great day looks like to me is I wake up, I, uh, you know, sit on my bed, I turn on the timer for 20 minutes. I sit there and I'm just watching my thoughts and I'm just, you could call it meditating. For me, it's like taking out the emails in my, in my brain of what I'm actually thinking about, what I'm actually uh, holding on to, and uh, just trying to watch whatever's going on in my mind. Then I, uh, after the 20 minutes is done, sometimes I do 10, sometimes I do 15, but most of the time it's about 20. I go out, uh, put the you know toothpaste on the toothbrush. I bring the toothpaste into the sh- or the toothbrush into the shower, and I take a morning shower. And uh, within that morning shower, I am I, I'm not even thinking about anything. I feel like a morning shower is like one of those things that just like resets you for the entire day. And I don't do cold showers. I don't do any of that stuff. I, I love warm showers and I don't feel like I have to like over optimize myself to, to torture myself with cold showers. So like, you know, all, that. all respect to Wim Hof, but yeah, yeah, all respect. Um, sometimes in the shower, I'll actually sit down and I like to visualize my future. Uh, I like to visualize uh, where I want to be um, or where I'm going to be. And I like to actually keep the picture in my mind of like where I'm headed to. And, um, and then afterwards, I completely forget about that. I put on my clothes, put on my deodorant, all that kind of stuff. Today, I did my hair because I'm going to be on this interview today. <laughs> Usually, <laughs> I looks like good. To let, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Usually, I like to like go down. And then um, I wake up some most of the time before my wife and then my daughter. So I go down. I make a pot of coffee. And then I also make a protein shake for myself with like greens, but I don't drink the coffee and I don't take the greens. I drink water first and I take my supplements. So the supplements I'm taking are omega threes, uh, vitamin D, uh, obviously I'm taking a greens powder, ethylate greens with uh, my shakes. I'm doing ashwagandha right now. I'm doing NAC and, uh, and also turmeric with like black pepper in it. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing those right now, at least in the morning. And I take about half a liter to a liter of water first thing in the morning. Then afterwards, what I do is I (laughs) actually put on this, um, this thing called Shad Helmstetter's uh, self-talk program. So one of these things that I've been really like focusing on is just like my own self-talk, the way in which Mm -hmm. I speak to myself. And uh, this is one of these things that kind of like, I guess you could say like I listen to it or don't listen to it and just like programs the way in which I maneuver the conversations I have in my brain. And I play that for about like 33 minutes as I'm getting all this stuff ready. Uh, once like 7.20 hits the dot, I go out. If my family has not woken up yet, I will go out and I'll wake up my family because <laughs> my wife doesn't want her to sleep for too long. Um, and then I'll wake them up and then I will uh, play with my daughter. I'll change her diaper, um, give my wife a kiss, obviously. Sometimes lay in the bed with them while they're like, you know, just like, you know, laying themselves get up. Mm-hmm. And I'll play with my daughter and I'll do all that kind of stuff until 8 a.m. And then 8 a.m., uh, I, I sit down and I I work. I mean, like for me, um, one of the, I'll say like one of the biggest changes uh, to my life that uh, this thing has brought, which is like, uh, you know, I have, I have grown a social media following. I've grown on Twitter. One of the things that I've actually loved to do as a process of growing this stuff is actually write Mm -hmm. Um, so writing for Twitter and writing Mm -hmm. for my captions on Instagram and all that kind of stuff, I write out the stuff that I'm creating and putting out there into the world. And I do that from like eight to nine and after 9.00 AM, um, you know, let's just say like 9.00 AM to about 3.00 PM or even 4.00 PM. That's my work day. And then, uh, today I've actually started to incorporate something new, which is actually doing a post work day meditation, Mm -hmm. um, because I find that. When I go from work to being with family right afterwards, I still have the work in me. Yeah. And it's it's hard for me to really just like be there 
and to just like sit there, I can't just turn it on and off like that. Mm -hmm. So I need to, I need some sort of buffer zone and I don't want to drink like a, a, a alcohol or I don't want to do any like drugs. So I'm going to go and meditate and I meditate for about 10 to 15 minutes just to like get myself mm -hmm. reset, go back. And then I uh, chill with my family. We have dinner, all that kind of stuff. Put the baby to bed at around like 7 30, 8. Uh, one of the things I love to do just to like turn myself off is literally play like a game of like one video game, just like one, maybe half hour, 45 minutes, like video game. I'd rather do that than scroll on social media or scroll on the internet or go on like Netflix. Uh, that's just something mm -hmm. I love to do right now. I'm playing this, like, uh, you know, this, this, uh, fighter jet game because I just watched Top Gun Maverick and it was like the best freaking movie ever. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, this is so amazing. Um, and then my sleep routine is actually before that happens, I put on my blue light blockers around, I would say like 7.30, 7 o'clock. And um, my sleep routine is I drink a chamomile tea and take magnesium glycinate and L-theanine around 8.30. And then by the time it's like 9.30, I'm actually going to do a little bit of, actually, I put glycine in there now too, which is, which is something I'm testing out. Um, and then around 9.30, I'm going to do a uh, about 10 milligrams of about melatonin. Uh, I'm taking off all screens. I'm not looking at screens anymore. I'm spending some time with my wife. And then by uh, 10, a, 10 p.m., I'm you know just hitting the hay and getting ready or just like going to bed, essentially. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, like within that day, there's like workouts. Yeah, know, so I was going to ask you about that. So basically work out every single day. Uh, like I do four days of weight training. Uh, the rest of the days I take a walk or, you know, I've been doing like hill sprints right now since it's been like a little bit like warmer and there's like a hill right beside me that we're living at right now. So uh, pretty much like uh, on the off days, I do like, let's just say, quote unquote cardio, but really like my cardio is just like walking in nature. And actually, like one of the times I was walking in nature, I know like I said, like, you know, don't bring a podcast with you, but I was doing research for our interview with each other. Um, and then I was like listening to that entire like uh, podcast today. I was just like, oh, just kind of going through. I, you know, I listened to this story that you had about a guy who, uh, who had uh, actually like had like celiac, uh, yeah. and then yeah, and then he ended up uh, getting rid of his mental problems because he just like got off of gluten. I thought that was like super cool. Um, but yeah, like I take a walk and uh, pretty much like this, there's this like ravine and um, in, in the forest, and I've really gotten into this like concept of forest bathing. Mm -hmm. um yeah so so dude it is like forest bathing is like one of the coolest things ever and if you're listening to this you're like what the heck is forest bathing it's literally just going into a forest and being as like being as aware of like everything that you're seeing inside of that forest and just walking in nature it's literally just like walking in nature and that just has this like crazy like reset effect for your body for your brain increases creativity and i do that on the off days uh, on the other days, I just like work out and, you know, lift weights and mm. do all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So, yeah. So that's kind of like what the routine is right there. Mm. And speaking of forest bathing, um, something that comes up for me sort of in connection with that is uh, grounding or uh, yeah. what do people call that? Um, where you uh, earthing uh, yes. where, you know, maybe you're walking barefoot or maybe you aren't wearing rubber yeah. shoes or is that something you got into as a part of your kind of like nature reset or no? Mm, I, so I don't think I do that right at this very moment. But uh, when I was living in Mexico, which was just like a couple months ago, uh, it was like bare feet everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and I have this thing. It's like, I think shoes are great, but to a certain degree, they kind of um, reduce the friction that our feet are supposed to feel mm -hmm. on the ground. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I remember I was, uh, I was earthing or grounding. Um, and this is actually something I do if I'm switching time zones. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to like mountain time, then that's going to be something where I'm just like digging my feet into the ground, into the mm -hmm. grass and doing that for about like, you know, 25, 30 minutes, just to, like acclimate myself to the time zone mm -hmm. of, of, mm -hmm. of which I am in. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it's not something that I necessarily uh, do, but I do try to spend as much time barefoot mm -hmm. as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for walking us through your day and, yeah. and the routines and it's, um, yeah, it's really helpful to hear, you know, how you do it. Yeah, definitely not perfect. Um, for sure. 
But uh, what I would say is, it's just like, damn, uh, I realized like it's so cool just to fall in love with like the boring consistency of like doing all that kind of stuff. You know, I, I used to think like this was like boring uh, when I was like a younger kid, you know, and I was like living like a grandpa. I'm like, dude, living like a grandpa is the best. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. There's something really sexy about being boring. Yeah. 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 The routines uh, set you free for sure. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. 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 Wow. Well, I, we, uh, we always end our, our podcasts with, uh, I say we, cause usually Keith is here with me. Yes, um, <laughs> but, uh, we, we always ask the same question every time, uh, which is, uh, if you could put a statement on a billboard that everyone would see once in their lifetime, uh, what would you want to say to folks? Did I ask you this too? And I think you did. Yeah. I think I, you did. Damn it. I put you on the, no, no, <laughs> I'm on the spot. Um, if I were to put anything on a billboard for everyone to see, what would I put there? Only thing that comes to mind is just like, get your body in shape. That's it. Just get in shape. Mm -hmm. um, dude, like if you, if you actually take the time to, let's just say, fix your diet, to eat nutrient dense foods, uh, to drink water, filtered water, to get exercise, you would not believe the amount of mental health issues that you can solve as a result of getting yourself healthy and doing just healthy things and being a healthy human being. And this is not to say that you're going to have the need to supersede, you know, therapy or anything like that. But I mean, the mind dictates or the body dictates the mind to a very large degree. So if you just uh, did healthy things, then, you know, your mind would actually be healthy as a result. So, yeah, man. Yeah. 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 It's, um, I can't hear that message enough. Um, and the fundamentals, it's, um, it goes back to what you and I were talking about a few minutes ago of like trying to skip the fundamentals, you know? And I remember back in the day when I was just beginning my, my, you know, journey as a psychiatrist, I had medications and therapy, uh, to, give people. And as I mentioned on your podcast, I got an hour of nutrition in med school, one hour. So I literally posted that today. I literally posted that today. I, I, mean, I think you crazy. liked it, but dude, I was crazy. just like, that's nuts. Yeah. That is nuts. Yeah. And, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And so I remember people, you know, coming to my office and, you know, really suffering and, uh, you know, depression, anxiety, whatever, bipolar. And, um, you know, not, and, you know, probably needing medication, um, for a period of time, mm -hmm. but, um, but no one ever had really talked to most of them about the, the fundamentals. Like you can't, whoops, <laughs> weird. <laughs> I wonder, that's interesting timing. Yeah. Um, you turn that off. Uh, <laughs> that's my, that's my alarm to snack. That sounded, oh yeah. I remember I to that. eat. I love that. <laughs> that that sounded like uh, the house that you're uh, that you're living in. I remember <laughs> you're having a conversation. He <laughs> <Yeah>, had <laughs> crickets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I think it's it, it can't be said enough. You know, the fundamentals are are critical. Like you you mm -hmm. can't skip that. You can't think you're going to be well. Yeah. Without sleep, good good amounts of water, the right nutrition, the right amount of activity. And, um, you know, I, I also want to just thank you because I, you know, I was on this path, you know, I uh, just want to share this with the listeners that, you know, you really helped me break through uh, a kind of, a, a, I had some blinders on, you know, mm. in my own health journey and like mm. thinking that uh, manipulating my diet without working out the right way. I mean, I, I was working out the wrong way. And that's mm -hmm. a really important piece of information too. Like mm -hmm. that um, when we think about personalized medicine, we think about like the right prescription for the right person. Yeah. So when we talk about fundamentals, we're also talking about like a, a personalized prescription. Uh, yeah. 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 When we, when we first started uh, working together, I, I really do feel that very like tiny levers can actually lead to the biggest differences 
And a lot of times, like we do things to our bodies because other people tell us to to do them because other people are doing them. And I, I remember when we were starting to work together. <clears throat> actually, one of the things that we did was like change up your meal timing. Yeah, very. That's like the most basic thing, right? Basic. But no one yeah. thinks about it. No one thinks about it because they're like, I gotta do fasting, or I gotta like you know eat keto or whatever it is. But Mm -hmm. like the thing is is that like even something simple like timing is one of those things that people don't necessarily put into consideration and when we think about timing let's just say like timing i was like looking at you holistically like how much stress were you going through what was happening when you're going back home right and it's just like little customizations that you do here and there to optimize you as a human being and make sure it works with your life uh, those things can go a long way and they can change your life. I know that for a fact. So, yeah. You know. Well, I'm proof of that. So, thank <laughs> yeah. you. Well, we got to get you new shirts. We were just talking about this. We got to get, get you new shirts now. <laughs> well, <laughs> Dan, thanks. It's uh, It's been a real pleasure having yeah, you on the show. Welcome. Really appreciate you. Dude, this is a pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me on and thanks for this amazing conversation. Uh, mm. I really do appreciate uh, the conversations that we've just had and the conversations that we have in general. Um, Mm. yeah, they're fucking awesome. So Mm. thanks. Thanks. And how, how do you, if people want to learn more about your work or follow you, where, where should they go? Yeah. Go to my, uh, Twitter accounts. Uh, it's at fit founder. Um, go to my, uh, Instagram account. It's at Dan founder. And, uh, if you want to work with me, you can go to highperformancefounder.com. And uh, yeah, those those are the places you can reach me. Awesome. We'll we'll make sure those are in the show notes as well, so people can find you. Hundred percent. Thank you. All right. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it.